Hello everyone and welcome to the first ever AWS Public Sector Summit Online 2020. Look, we're so disappointed that we can't be with you here in person, but we're thrilled to be with you virtually. These are certainly challenging times and here at Amazon, we're committed to facing these challenging times together. We don't have all the answers, but we're doing what we can do to help employees, our customers and our partners and the communities that we call home around the world. In early June, Amazon announced a donation of $10 million to help organizations across the United States that support justice and equity. The inequitable and brutal treatment of Black and African Americans is unacceptable, and we believe that Black lives matter. At Amazon, we stand in solidarity with our Black employees, customers, and partners. We're committed to helping build a country and a world where everyone can live with dignity and without fear. We're also working around the world to help customers and partners and communities respond to COVID-19. When the pandemic began, we knew that we had to flex and change the way we worked in order to help our customers get through the crisis. This was especially important for the public sector workers who were working around the clock to respond. One of the biggest steps we took was to bring teams across Amazon together to work as one. We reached out to world leaders to offer our support and prioritize the critical needs of customers, including delivering healthcare equipment, educational supplies, and food to those in need. We also acted to ensure that AWS data center operations did not miss a beat. And we've seen public sector organizations move so fast during this time. In fact, we've seen more innovation and movement in the past two to three months than we've seen over the last two years. Nine U.S. federal agencies turned to AWS to scale new services and adjust to new work arrangements. AWS also helped 14 U.S. states launch unemployment insurance call centers so they could quickly respond to the citizens and individuals in need. And today, I want to celebrate what you've done, share lessons learned, and let you hear from mission-driven leaders who are making a difference in cloud computing. So let's start by looking at some cloud solutions that we created to specifically respond to COVID-19. These projects show how bringing researchers together with the power of cloud is a true game changer. For example, open data is a powerful tool in a way that can be used to speed up time to insights, to help researchers gain faster insights into COVID-19. We move more than 70 unique third-party data sets onto the AWS Data Exchange. These data sets included COVID-related public records, foot traffic from businesses, economic activity data, and more. We also built a search website that analyzes the COVID-19 research database, which contains more than 47,000 research documents. This search engine uses AWS machine learning to deliver precise answers to research questions, along with the research documents associated. In just seven weeks after the website launch, we've had more than tens of millions of queries across 76 countries, including those from China, Japan, Germany, and the UK. And to accelerate the pace of new research, we launched the AWS Diagnostic Development Initiative, or DDI, in March, and we committed $20 million in credits and technical support for researchers focused on diagnostic solutions in this area. This work isn't limited to just COVID-19, we're interested in advancing a wide, range of a wide range of diagnostic solutions. And today, the DDI project is supporting over 35 programs, and we're committed to this long-term. If you have a project, please, or idea that deserves support, I want you to apply. We're also a founding member of the COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortium. This effort brings together industry, academia, and the U.S. federal government to provide compute resources to COVID-19 researchers. And today, we're supporting more than a dozen research projects through this consortium, and that number is growing daily. 
I want you to stay tuned because we're going to continue to update on all these programs and the projects as they move along. Now let's talk about secure contact tracing. We've seen many customers choose to use cloud computing to modernize their approach to contact tracing. They've chosen cloud computing for a few reasons, to scale, move fast, and pull together the analytics in order to form a common operating picture. And top of mind for these customers is security and privacy. AWS helps our customers quickly meet their required security controls for sensitive data and allows them to provide greater transparency for citizens to make those informed choices. Customers can also quickly establish privacy parameters that are in line with legal and regulatory controls. With security and privacy controls in place, these solutions can empower our government community leaders, and all citizens and individuals to achieve public health goals and drive economic recovery much faster. The stories I've shared with you are just a small sample of the solutions that we've seen developed in response to COVID-19. Now, our first speaker is going to share another story of how cloud computing has helped her organization respond to the crisis by scaling virtual healthcare solutions. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Sharon Baker, Vice President of Technology Services for Ontario Health, OTN, a virtual healthcare provider in Toronto, Canada. When COVID-19 arrived in Canada, Sharon and her team experienced an exponential increase in demand for their services. And as Sharon's going to tell you, cloud computing helped them to respond to this demand quickly and provide world-class care. Please put your hands together for me virtually and welcome Sharon to the stage. Thank you, Teresa. It's a pleasure to be here. And hello, everyone. OTN is a virtual care network. Through the OTN Hub, we provide products and services to patients and physicians in Ontario. In April, we became part of Ontario Health. We believe that virtual healthcare is about people, not technology. It is provided by people, consumed by people, and ultimately exists to help people. Our mission at OTN is to partner with others to inspire and accelerate virtual care, to better connect people and care across Ontario's health system. We've been pursuing virtual care policy and associated funding with the government to allow providers to choose their preferred platform. In this way, we are helping to broaden the ways in which virtual care can be provided. Essentially, we're focused on taking virtual care mainstream. Time for your breathing treatment. Okay. Demand for virtual care has grown, with a 1,500% increase in active users on the OTN Hub since 2018. And it's grown significantly over the last couple of months as a result of COVID-19, with more healthcare providers than ever seeing patients directly in their homes. We went from a daily average of 3,800 events and 8,000 participants to over 12,000 events and 30,000 participants per day, almost overnight in early March. The only way we were able to successfully scale was by leveraging the cloud. While we had expected to see an increase in volume due to COVID-19 pressure, we had experienced a demand that we just couldn't have imagined. We were worried that our current infrastructure was not up to the challenge. And we did have some bumps in the first few weeks, but working with our video provider in AWS, we were able to leverage the scalability of the cloud and address these issues quickly. Even before the pandemic, Back in 2017, we had realized the need to modernize our approach in order to ensure 24-7 network access, 
for our users with high quality video. We were experiencing many pain points with our on-premise IT infrastructure as our network continued to grow. There were environmental bottlenecks and long overnight deployments requiring significant resourcing and hands-on management. This was creating issues for our members, including unexpected outages and downtime. And we wanted to be able to focus our internal resources on creating value, not on the day-to-day -day tasks related to scaling the platform to meet demand. So we made a very important decision to partner with AWS to assist in managing the network and migrate it to the cloud so we could concentrate on delivering more value to our customers in a cost-effective way. The first thing we did was migrate our video conference infrastructure. We completed a stage transition to a new video infrastructure in under a year, starting with our room-based systems, followed by our PC-based systems. This allowed us to optimize costs and availability, achieving significant improvements in reliability. Then we implemented video conference reporting. By using Athena, Glue, and S3, we were able to upload operational data and generate critical monthly summary reports. Building this initial foundation in the cloud was instrumental in helping us quickly migrate our website, otn.ca, behind AWS CloudFront to keep up with the increased pandemic demand. And we are now really confident in our ability to auto scale as needed in the future. We were also able to securely migrate and implement a web application firewall with standard protection rules. This action alone has improved the availability of our website and protects us against a constant stream of web-based scans. Working with AWS, we were able to migrate our most critical infrastructure with extremely high confidence and flexibility. And we've learned a lot along the way and realized some incredible results. Increasing our system availability with little to no downtime for deployments, eliminating those bottlenecks we talked about earlier and improving security. And we can now scale up and down quickly to meet demand. We are optimizing our investment. We are creating value. And most importantly, patients and providers have been able to access reliable quality service in a time of critical need. And we believe quality service will be pivotal in maintaining high levels of adoption following the pandemic ensuring virtual care is a trusted healthcare option and available whenever and wherever it's needed. And we're not done yet. We're continuing on our cloud journey and are moving the rest of our virtual care web and mobile application platform to the AWS infrastructure to take advantage of the elasticity provided by EC2 S3 serverless web hosting. Over time, we're planning to revolutionize our analytics process to create a modern real-time analytics platform, leveraging Kinesis, S3 Data Lakes, Redshift, and Athena. And we're migrating from on-premise servers to simple storage service, serverless-based hosting. As virtual care continues to be embraced, there's much more we can accomplish through our ongoing innovation supported by OTN Hub in the cloud we will keep improving patient care. Virtual care is the future, but it appears the future is now. We're so excited to be working with our members and partners during this time of accelerated system transformation. We are confident that our experience combined with our network running on AWS's modern infrastructure will make that more possible than ever before. Thank you so much, Sharon, and thank you to everyone at Ontario Health OTN for going above and beyond to care for so many patients who have needed your help. The challenges and opportunities that Sharon described aren't limited to healthcare organizations, of course. We've all been forced to figure out new ways to work, learn, care for our families, and connect with our friends. The solutions you built are fundamentally changing the way public sector approaches IT. Quite simply, there's no going back to the old way of thinking. So let's take a look at what's changed and how these new models will evolve over time. One of the biggest changes has been the transition to remote work. In a poll conducted by Harris Research, more than half of all employed Americans have transitioned to working from home. And I'm sure that's true globally. At AWS, we've moved thousands of employees to work remotely with work arrangements. We used our own services, including video conferencing or our Amazon Chime, 
virtual call centers or Amazon Connect, and collaborative content or sharing tools called Amazon WorkDocs. I've been amazed by how our teams have embraced this new model. And we're not alone. Some of our customers have told us that they may never send employees back to the office. Others will create a new model that provides more remote work opportunities for employees. Regardless of your approach, we want you to be able to choose the remote work tools that are right for you. Take video conferencing. Many customers have turned to Amazon Chime to quickly get started with audio calls and video conferences at scale. In addition, organizations can add the same functionality to their own existing applications by using Amazon Chime SDK. For instance, a healthcare provider can add video calling to their mobile application or a government can add calling capabilities to agency websites to provide more responsive citizen services. To learn how to build your own virtual meeting application, visit the URL you see on screen. The second major change in the transition to distance learning. According to UNESCO, more than 1.2 billion students in 86 countries are out of the classroom. Many educational institutions have turned to online learning to keep students engaged. Blackboard, the largest educational technology and services company in the world, used AWS to scale to 50 times their usual capacity in just 24 hours to meet the increased demand. And scrappy startups like Khajiit are expanding access to online learning by providing hotspots to educators that are compliant with federal laws protecting children's access to online content. Hopeful School District in Virginia has already installed this technology on buses and will drive the buses to communities with no connectivity. This is really a creative solution to give every student the opportunity to learn. This is the reality that classrooms may be changed forever, which is why we're so committed to supporting as many new models of learning as possible. And that's why I'm particularly excited to share the recent winners of the first ever Amazon Alexa EdTech Challenge. EdTech shared how they're using voice technology to authentically engage students of all ages. For example, the EdTech Say Kid created an application of play-based learning to enhance early childhood education. And for students in grades K through five, Vogo Voice created an interactive skill to help students at home develop their critical thinking, empathy, and decision-making skills. And this is just one example of the rapid innovation happening in education. I encourage you to visit the AWS Public Sector blog and subscribe to the AWS Fix This podcast for more great ideas. The changes I've mentioned reflect a simple fact. All individuals in a community expect more, not less, from their public sector, especially in a crisis. And at no point in my lifetime have individuals tuned in two to three times a day or more to hear from their governments. The agencies and departments that have responded best didn't worry about technical debt or legacy IT. They focused on their mission. Take the state of West Virginia which saw a dramatic spike in call volume to their unemployment insurance hotline. By the second week of April, existing call centers were overwhelmed with over 77,000 calls a day. The state worked with the AWS partner Smartronics to stand up a cloud-based call center in just 72 hours. A week later, the new call center processed a record 61,252 calls a day. And this is just the start. Joshua Spence, West Virginia CTO, sees opportunities for more innovation. And here's what he said. Technology is a force multiplier. And when it comes to our ability to answer questions and citizens need our help. And before I turn things over to our next speaker, I wanna share one more story that's near and dear to my heart. The US Census Bureau made a pivotal decision years ago to modernize by embracing commercial cloud. By building 2020census.gov on AWS, the Census Bureau has been able to accept census responses online for the very first time. 
This proved especially important when COVID-19 struck. And without a digital response portal, the process of conducting the census would have been significantly delayed. But today, more than 60% of households have completed the 2020 census, and more than 80% of those respondents have completed the U.S. Census online. And if you haven't done so, I encourage you to log on 2020census.gov and complete your census today. So now I want to turn things over to our next speaker. Scott Jensen is the director of the Rhode Island Department of Labor and Training. And as you'll hear how he and the state have taken a mission first approach to IT innovation. The story Scott will share shows how bold and quick actions can yield to very big results. Please put your hands together virtually and welcome Scott to the stage. Thanks, Teresa. The Department of Labor and Training, our mission is simple. We're here to help Rhode Islanders succeed in the economy. This can take many forms. We partner with businesses to provide demand-driven job training programs so Rhode Islanders can get the skills they need for an in-demand job. We enforce labor laws that ensure Rhode Island workers are treated fairly, and we keep our state informed by providing the most up-to-date labor market information available. Another part of this mission is taking care of Rhode Islanders when they find themselves out of work through our unemployment insurance program. And it's called unemployment insurance for a reason. You only insure something that's valuable, and our people are Rhode Island's most valuable asset. Across the country, unemployment insurance programs rely on very creaky old school tech, and Rhode Island was particularly old and particularly creaky. Our system was originally built in the 1980s and relies on a coding language, COBOL, that barely anyone even knows anymore. COVID-19 sparked an unemployment crisis at a magnitude that these decades old systems were never prepared to handle. Previously, Rhode Island's record claim in a week was just over 5,000. That was in 1992. Since March, we've exceeded this number in a single day on 12 separate occasions. With unemployment insurance expanding under the CARES Act, we conducted a spike analysis and realized early on that this would become a huge problem if we didn't develop a solution and fast. We reached out to the nonprofit organization Research Improving People's Lives, or Ripple, and AWS. They came to us with solutions and made them happen quickly. AWS understood both the goal and the urgency. This was not a commercial project, but something we had to get done in order to do our jobs the best we could, and ultimately get Rhode Islanders the benefits they needed during this global pandemic. As the Wall Street Journal recently reported, states were given federal funding to put towards our unemployment insurance programs. While many states used this funding to hire more staff to manually go through claims, we knew that no amount of staffing would be able to scale to match the incoming influx. Instead, we decided to put more money into hardware and software, increasing productivity per person, savings, and ultimately allowing us to get more claims processed faster. We launched a new cloud-based application for the Pandemic Unemployment Insurance Program, which came about through the CARES Act for people who were previously ineligible for benefits. The first day it launched, April 7th, was the most claims we received in a single day ever, nearly 16,000 claims. Thanks to the AWS cloud, we were able to take in all those claims without any issues. There was no way the old system would have been able to handle that increased amount. We implemented Amazon Connect in just 10 days, replacing the department's legacy IVR and IWR systems to expand our capacity by being able to take simultaneous calls. The old system could only handle 74 calls at a time. After the new technology was implemented, we can now take in up to 1,000 calls per minute. We also added Amazon Lex to our website as another solution to take some strain off of our call center. This chatbot allows claimants to ask questions about unemployment insurance and get answers instantly, helping to manage the recent increase in inquiries. The results that we've been able to achieve in such a short amount of time are incredibly impressive. Rhode Island is far ahead of the pack in both taking in claims and getting them processed, as you can see in this graph created by an economist at the Census Bureau. In a period of just a few weeks, 
we received over 200,000 applications for unemployment, which is nearly 20% of the state's entire population, surpassing the number of claims received in all of 2009 at the height of the Great Recession. This year alone, we saw the dramatic increase from Rhode Island paying 2,700 claims in February 2020 to over 70,000 paid in April. We would not have been able to keep up and handle this influx using our old creepy system. So we're doing the best out of the country, which is excellent, and we couldn't have done it without AWS. But if you look at the graph, you'll still see that we're only at 51% of claims paid showing that we have a lot more work to do. We don't celebrate until we've gotten each and every claim paid, but we're proud of the progress being made to implement changes and solutions quickly to support our community. And as we continue to work with AWS and modernize our systems and approaches, we're excited about the additional ways that we can improve our overall citizen experience. We've learned a lot throughout this process, but one of the biggest takeaways is that speed can happen in the public sector. And we're happy to be an example of this after implementing a completely new system in just a matter of days. Government organizations are sometimes scared of change and can be slow to adapt. Rebuilding systems that have puttered along for decades can be daunting, but it's even more of a risk to just keep doing what you're doing. Speed in the public sector is possible and incorporating modern solutions is essential to driving mission. If we can do it, so can you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Scott's inspiring story demonstrates what can be achieved when organizations work backwards from their mission to create the right IT solutions. So before we close today, I want to share a few principles and exciting announcements that are designed to help you achieve similar results. First, security is still the foundation of all that you do and is still job zero here at AWS. AWS continues to be the home of more FedRAMP authorized solutions than any other cloud provider. As of the end of May, 110 third-party solutions have achieved FedRAMP authorization on AWS. That's more than four times as many FedRAMP authorized solutions than the next two commercial cloud providers combined. Second, partners can accelerate your success. Over the last few months, we've seen partners move faster to meet public sector needs. Accenture stood up a virtual contact center in the state of New Mexico in just two days. And in only seven days, Deloitte went live with a customer chatbot for Montana Department of Public Health and Human Services. The chatbot is now helping Montana's apply more quickly for food, medical, and cash assistance. And I'm thrilled to announce that today, we're launching a partner solutions page that has ready to go solutions for remote work, contact centers and more. And I encourage you all to explore the solutions today by visiting the URL you see on screen. And if you're a partner who wants to include a solution on the site, please reach out to your AWS account executive. My next principle for success is to tap AWS credits to get your big ideas off the ground. And while we can't say yes to everything, even though I want to, we want to help. That's why today I'm pleased to announce that the 2020 AWS Imagine Grant Program is now accepting applications. And we're looking for those big ideas that can scale to serve your mission. Imagine Grant winners can receive up to $100,000 in cash to jumpstart their projects. They'll also benefit from training, credits, and technical support to make their ideas a reality. And if you're a not-for-profit with a big idea, we wanna hear from you, so apply today. AWS is committed to supporting our customers' missions, even those outside the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth and space-based systems that we build now will inform nearly every decision we make in the years to come. We want to bring all those AWS tools to bear to help our customers succeed in space. So today, I'm so excited to welcome retired Air Force General Clint Crozier as the new leader of the AWS Aerospace and Satellite Team. He will lead a team of experts that's ready to bring cloud solutions to serve your space missions. 
The aerospace and satellite team is already supporting customers around the world. Many of these customers are leveraging AWS Ground Station to downlink, process, analyze, and distribute data in a cost-effective way. Large and established organizations can use AWS Ground Station to rapidly scale their satellite communications operations. And space startups are growing faster by using AWS Ground Station to avoid major capital expenditures that would be required to build satellite ground infrastructures. In fact, I'm really excited to announce today that one of the most dynamic space satellite startups, Capella Space, is going all in on AWS. Capella Space is doing really amazing work. They will soon launch the world's largest commercial SAR satellite constellation. Unlike traditional optical satellites, Capella's SAR satellite constellation sees through clouds and darkness. And when fully deployed, the satellite constellation will capture hourly coverage of every point on Earth. That's really important for use cases such as defense and intelligence monitoring, detection of illegal maritime activities, and mapping natural disaster damage to deliver humanitarian aid. Capella Space has already migrated its SAR databases to AWS, and together with AWS Services and AWS Ground Station, Capella Space is dramatically accelerating the speed at which data can be collected from space, analyzed, and acted upon. So whether your sites are set on the stars or in your local community, the final principle I wanna share with you is the most fundamental, migrate fast. The COVID-19 crisis showed just how fast organizations can move when missions need to drive decision-making. These migrations happened under exceptional circumstances, but they offer a playbook for the new normal. Long before COVID-19, our next speaker was accelerating their own migration to AWS. By questioning their own assumptions about the time and cost of migrating to the cloud, they were able to deploy a cloud-based solution to over 70,000 customers around the globe. And here to explain more, please welcome Edward Quick, the Program Manager of the Navy Enterprise Business Solutions Program. Thank you, Teresa. Navy Enterprise Resource Planning Program, Navy ERP, is the Department of Navy's financial system of record built on SAP, providing financial acquisition and supply management functionality to the Navy's major commands, which delivers reliable financial information for leadership to keep our Navy moving forward. Navy ERP handles nearly $70 billion in financial transactions each year and has over 72,000 users around the world. So availability and reliability are critical business requirements. Our on-premise enterprise systems were at end of life, hard to scale and prone to critical system outages. And our users referred to Navy ERP as fragile. Our data analytics were too slow and moved offline. Functionally, the Navy has also been operating across multiple separate ledger systems with a goal to consolidate into a single one. So recently, we decided to modernize our financial management capabilities by migrating to AWS GovCloud, which we completed in just under 10 months, nearly half of the time it was originally expected to take, given its complexity, marking the Navy's largest cloud migration to date. Adoption of the cloud has been critical in helping to achieve operational benefits, improve security, increase availability and reliability, while increasing data accessibility. But getting to this point was not easy. Public sector organizations, especially in the government, can tend to be risk adverse, and we are no exception when making these decisions. We initially planned to start the migration with a pilot project because of the anticipated time and costs associated with it. And we understood that a complete migration would be a huge undertaking, but the way we were operating was inefficient and unsustainable. So stakeholders agreed, now is the time to make the change to help improve overall availability and reliability. It's also seen as a significant step towards consolidating to a single general ledger, which is essential to the department's ability to produce accurate financial information, obtain a clean audit opinion, and improve our data analytic capability. Because of the size and complexity of the migration, we faced several unique hurdles along the way that we didn't only overcome, we did so in an expedited timeline. 
So let me tell you how we did this and share some of the lessons learned. First, it helped that from the very beginning, we received political and financial support from Navy leadership for our migration to the cloud, as it was seen as a key priority for the Navy. However, the original timeline projection was too long at 18 months, mostly driven by external reviews, as it was the first time going through the risk management framework process. But we knew we could not take time from them. So we improved the package submissions by adding engineering rigor to our testing processes, procedures, and documentation to ensure the highest quality, reducing the back and forth for reviews and cutting down the overall time needed. Another problem we ran into was that working with a database over 13 terabytes, which was larger than the Sweden HANA servers at the time, we had to come up with innovative approaches to reduce the database size. Our database copies were running over 30 days, too long for an outage during a cutover. Working with AWS, we were able to quickly come up with a two-punch mitigation process using Snowball Edges in conjunction with SAP's near-zero downtime to migrate to AWS GovCloud in just three days. The magnitude of this accomplishment has been incredible and will help continue to enhance the performance of our force. Bringing our system into the cloud increases visibility and availability of data so the Navy can make timely and informed decisions about its financial reporting and budgets, maintenance and repair logs, and conduct advanced analytics. As an example, pulling financial reports through the advanced analytics used to take around 20 hours, so we'd only run them once a week. Now we're able to pull them under four hours, and we can run these reports more frequently, providing a better customer experience. With cloud-based performance, we deployed our first self-service business intelligence capability to our users. And given the high importance of security, putting the Navy ERP in the cloud also adds a layer of protection to the data. With only one cloud-based suppository of data to protect instead of a myriad of computing hardware. And we're the first in the Navy to develop a dual AWS GovCloud regions east-west for true regional disaster recovery. And there's still even more to come. We're on track to consolidate these financial systems into one general ledger for audit readiness, something the Navy has never done before. We are also able to bring on new users from working capital fund commands into a platform that is secure and stable versus the more fragile systems that we have in place previously. In addition to system improvements, we have the ability to scale to a point that we couldn't have even considered prior to this. By the time all systems migrate, Navy RP will double in size and the infrastructure will already be in place. This migration to the cloud has given us the resilience needed, not only for where we are at today, but position us for the opportunities and success of tomorrow. Thank you, Edward, and thank you all for joining us today. Even though this keynote's been virtual, so it's been a little bit different than most, I hope you see how solutions created in a crisis are really creating a new age for public sector IT and the mission. I really encourage you all to continue exploring the summit breakout sessions and watch the closing keynote with Max Peterson. Max is going to share some immediate next steps that you can take to continue your own modernization efforts. At every summit, I like to take a moment and say thank you for being our customer, our partner, and for making these events so special. You're an amazing community of learners and builders, and I hope this summit helps you learn and build in the months to come. Seeing your passion for innovation and dedication to mission just gives me hope, especially in these challenging times. And thank you again for joining and I hope to see you all again soon in person.